Good morning, uh, and thank you for coming this morning, uh, and especially thank you to the EIF for organising the event and offering me the platform, and to Malcolm personally for hosting this morning. I'm sure you know already, but just to remind you, BT is a global ICT company operating in 170 countries. We serve business, government, business and government customers outside of the UK, and we provide services to all customers in, in the UK. My role focuses on leading our, our approach in the UK SME and consumer segment against hundreds of UK-based um, competitors and on overall group marketing, as well as our business in the Republic of Ireland as well. That means over 18 million consumers, 1 million SME customers and 250,000 sorry, 25,000 employees within BT Retail. I'm also passionately interested in the role of ICT in helping to drive sustainability and energy efficiency across all businesses through smart ICT solutions. And I lead on this work for the board. Now, our two strategic thrusts. First of all, to build a world-class, super-fast broadband network in the UK offering open access to all competitors and service and content providers as well. And secondly, to deepen our footprint in global networked IT services, focusing on business segments such as financial services and with increased investment in Asia in particular. Now, Brussels policy making is critically important to our success or failure in these goals. And that means balanced policy making. And this is a point I shall touch on later. Now, we've been very encouraged by the EU 2020 plans and strategy and by the interlocking elements from the Commission, Council and Parliament. The relaunch of the EU 27 single market, I know that's something that's very close to Malcolm's heart in particular. The digital agenda from Mrs. Kroos, a pro-competitive industrial policy, more drive on open trade in third country markets, a new innovation union, and a European Council devoted to innovation in December. A review of EU data protection laws under Ms. Reading. Last Thursday's Inter-Institutional Net Neutrality Summit. An imminent commission paper on new skills and talent, as well as a, thought, a thoughtful cross-sectional green papers on pensions and corporate governance. This is all good, I think, and debate on these issues is all about Europe's future. But it, all, it could all turn out bad if one of two things happen, and that's either we debate too long without acting uh, at an EU or national level, or we debate far too many things, whether policy or legislative, as a few key goals are better than um, second-order goals across the board. So balanced policymaking is indeed needed. Fair balance between market participants and also due balance between facilitating innovative competitive business models and appropriately protecting the legitimate rights of consumers at the same time. We don't want new business ideas in Europe rendered stillborn through preemptive or premature regulation. Customers, not regulators, should determine which products and services they use. Now, we must move ahead on the agenda fast. The telecom sector, which is key to the business models in almost all other sectors across the economy and underpins growth in the new carbon economy in particular, is a great example. And I'll look now at a couple of key areas where Europe must act and can act. First of all, platform competition. Our philosophy is to ask from others on their platforms only what we offer ourselves in the UK market. We believe that economic growth and jobs will come from fierce competition, not national or sectoral protectionism. We offer equivalent competition-ready access to our copper and fibre networks, to other broadband providers uh, and other, other internet service providers across the UK. And that's on the same terms and the same conditions as we provide our retail arm which is the part of the business I'm responsible for. We are building the equivalent of the fibre network in Singapore every single quarter at the moment. 
BT has committed to over 30 billion euros of investment in this program, um, which rolls out to, to two thirds of UK homes uh, over the next five years. That's over 50,000 kilometres of fibre, which will be installed by over 30,000 engineers to give you a sense of the scale of the operation. Now, we've already got um, ADSL 2 Plus, which is delivering um, up to 20 megs uh, download speed to 1.6 million customers across the UK. We have about 5.5 million to give you a sense of that. Um, and over 5,000 customers a week are signing up now to our superfast broadband service, BT Infinity, uh, which is uh, proving to be very, very popular uh, as we begin to roll it out. Now, we agreed undertakings four years ago with Ofcom to provide robust functional separation for our access and backhaul networks. We do not suggest this approach as a prescriptive measure for other national markets, but we do expect fair access. The EU telecoms framework package and the NGA recommendation are examples of good, balanced policy making in our mind. But a drive on implementation, perhaps using Beric for best practice, is really now needed. Likewise, the state aid guidelines on NGA need to be applied pragmatically. We are delighted that Cornwall County Council in the, in the southwest of England was able to announce the biggest rural fibre plan in the EU, part funded by ESF monies, which BT will be building. We have had similar success in Northern Ireland. Now, we need similar competition and regulatory regimes in converging market areas as well. Triple play bundles of broadband and pay TV and fixed or mobile communications are increasingly the norm in our markets. Servicing customer needs effectively means that the dominant hold of some operators in spectrum or content must be broken so that a level playing field of competition can operate in converging markets and so that new players are allowed access to increased competition and innovation to benefit consumers. Now, this is particularly important where these platforms have market power or where they, have, or, or where they own unique assets that are economic bottlenecks. For example, BT is driving into the pay TV market in the UK through BT Vision, and we will be launching 3D and enhanced HD services soon and adding the BBC iPlayer uh, in the next couple of months as well. But we have been hampered by not getting fair wholesale access to Sky's premium film and sport channels, which are critical to have a competitive offer uh, in the marketplace. Now, Sky can access all our broadband networks, both the copper and the fibre networks, um, and in the, on the same terms as we receive, or I receive, as the CEO of BT Retail. And they can bundle these with their content services, which they've done quite successfully. But Sky refuses su to supply the content over which it has a stranglehold on competitive terms to BT Retail in exchange. This is not a level playing field, and it's not good for consumers. Now, next year, we are launching a new mass market TV platform called UView. This combines the benefits of broadcast TV delivered over digital terrestrial television and the benefits of TV delivered over broadband. Now, UView is a set of open standards for the next generation of TV platforms, which will allow all content providers to provide quality television to TV sets in the home. Now, that's whether they're free-to-air broadcasters, pay TV retailers, media service providers, or internet TV operators. Now, we are working with the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, other ISPs such as TalkTalk, Talk, um, and a number of other companies as well to deliver it. And I stress, this is an open platform. Now, because we are not in the business of forcing consumers to buy only what, they, what we want to sell them, other companies with a less open business model are trying to slow this down through regulatory means. Now, convergence is an overused word in our industry, yet it is clear that communication services are converging, both in product bundles and on platforms. It is a poor outcome when the fixed telecom network is open to real competition, but other parts of the equation are not. 
Now is the time for pay TV and content operators uh, and the markets they, they operate in to be opened up in the same way. Now, Ofcom has moved part of the way towards this, allowing some modest access to Sky content, but it's not enough and it's not uh, completely equivalent. Moving on, UK and EU regulators need to examine the media plurality and competition questions in News International's plans to buy the 61% of Sky, it, it, Sky shares it does not currently own. After this transaction, News Corporation would be the leading commercial media organisation in, in all the UK markets, every single one. Other than the BBC, they would be the leading provider in TV, radio and printed news, alone having a monopoly position uh, in uh, <coughs> also having a monopoly position in premium pay TV and 67% of the basic TV market as well. It is a hugely powerful and it is hugely powerful and threatens plurality and competition in the UK. The planned EU audiovisual sector communicator communication expected soon needs also to have a close look at the best practice uh, and the best balance across these markets in Europe. Now, the second issue I want to talk to is around social media. Social media such as user-generated user content like Twitter, Facebook uh, and YouTube and the relate, and related enabling technologies including cloud computing and the new business models they may uh, or will engender such as behavioural advertising services, these need nurturing and promoting. What they don't need is over-heavy or burdensome regulation before they've even got off the ground. Now let's work to a common set of consumer protection and privacy standards in the communication market and then let the market decide. The recently launched review of the data protection rules is a welcome opportunity to get things right. Of course, consumer rights must be protected by proportionate regulation and bespoke, but bespoke privacy regulation that attempts to head off every conceivable threat simply adds costs, and that means hurting job creation and growth, of course. A different example is the Digital Economy Act in the UK, which tried to put responsibility onto the ISPs for protecting the copyright of content owners. I'm sure we can find a workable solution to this, but without the heavy-handed regulation harming innocent uh, people and not often hitting the genuinely guilty. To take another BT example, if I may, we have developed Debatescape, a social media search tool which can aggregate, categorise and filter comments, posts and tweets from many different sources and present these to our call centre advisors. This allows them to monitor public sites for BT customers needing assistance and to respond in a personalised way with public messages or product information. This could be applicable to many customer-facing businesses. This is a fantastic new real-time customer care service for our, our, our customers. It assesses public information only, though. It has had strongly positive customer feedback. It has, in one or two cases, been misrepresented as, a, as Big Brother listening. It is too easy to take the trenchant view on these, these types of areas without getting the facts first. Now, the out... Ongoing net neutrality debate is linked, of course. BT strongly supports open access to the internet for its customers. We do not discriminate between providers of content and applications. And BT fundamentally believes in the need for a good basic service quality, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a good level of basic quality of service on the internet and also for improved transparency of customer information across Europe, for all market players. We will not specifically degrade any legal application on our standard service, but we do need to be able to manage the costs we incur in our network. No, work, no network of any kind can provide limitless capacity, telecoms, road or rail. We cannot predict with 100% accuracy how the market for co delivering content and applications will develop in the future, and nor can anyone else I believe. We do know that we do not want rules put in place that risk stifling innovation and differentiation. 
By all means, stamp out abusers of dominance, but do not try to guess where these abusers might arise and then put rules in to stop them. This would not be in anybody's interest. So, some big policy challenges, but some also some very big business opportunities across Europe. Thank you very much for your attention.